thank you very much, Matei. I am super excited to be here today to demonstrate exactly how you can use Apache Spark 2.0 inside of my favorite platform, Databricks Community Edition, which, as Matei just announced, is now available to everyone in the world for free. So head over to databricks.com and sign up. And after you've done that, you can go to the login screen to get into your personal workspace. So I'm going to start by logging in. And once it rehydrates my workspace, there we are. Uh, I'm in my own personal copy of Databricks. And what you'll see here is this is a cloud-based platform for running Apache Spark and doing big data analysis. It's got a whole bunch of tools, including interactive notebooks and automatic cluster management. Uh, and pretty much our goal when we were creating this platform was to make big data analytics tasks where simple things should be simple and complex things should be possible. So, uh, all of this automatic management actually makes a lot of the, the kind of complexity of running and dealing with fault tolerance a lot easier. But as Matei said, there's still this problem of the skills gap. Learning Spark, learning statistics can still be pretty difficult. And in this case, we didn't forget Spark's academic roots. We actually have a whole bunch of content built into the platform designed specifically to help you learn both statistics and Apache Spark. So if we click on training inside of the workspace, you'll see there's lectures from award-winning professors at UC Berkeley and Stanford that cover the basics of big data and data science. And this is no ordinary classroom. There are also interactive workbooks with explanations and code examples that you can actually run here in your browser. Uh, so I'm actually going to take this and say import. And it's actually going to make a copy of this particular lesson, which is written in Python. It's going to copy it into my own personal Databricks workspace. Once I've done that, I can actually you know, read through some of the explanation. And then when it comes time to test my knowledge, I can click on any of the cells and hit Shift Enter. And what you'll see is it automatically attached me to a Spark cluster running in the cloud, computed the answer, and returned it to my browser. I can go in and I can edit the text to test my understanding of Spark. So we'll kind of change that there. Good. It still checks out. Um, so this is pretty, a pretty great way to start learning the basics of Spark and, uh, and uh, of, of data science in general. However, once you're done with the basics, I find the best way to really dive in and fully understand a platform as complex as Apache Spark is to actually take a real world problem and look at how someone solved it. And here's where the featured notebooks come into play. We've taken a whole bunch of content where we've actually done end-to-end -end examples of how to use Apache Spark and built them into the platform. I'm going to start with an analysis that is pretty topical, given what today is, uh, the 2016 election tweets. And so what you'll see is this notebook actually takes data from the Twitter stream, and it graphs over time how, many, how often certain candidates are mentioned. And so they did this with Spark. Uh, they took Spark, they took Spark SQL, they took Spark Streaming, and they combined them together into this, this streaming program that's going to continually update the answer. So, you know, I'm, uh, Matei said we care a lot about APIs, so you can still use all of these Spark 1.0 APIs with Spark 2.0. But I'm actually pretty excited about the stuff that he talked about today. So I'm going to see if we can maybe rewrite this from scratch instead of going with this. So I'm going to go to File and click Clone, and we'll call this 2016 Election Tweets 2.0. So now that we've got this other notebook, I'm going to go ahead and just delete all of this code here. And instead, we're going to just start with Spark. So you'll see it, again, attached me to my Spark 2.0 cluster. And uh, what, what you'll see is we've actually got this thing called the Spark session. It's your one-stop shop for working with structured data and unstructured data, batch and streaming. This is the SQL context. This is the Spark context. This is the Hive context. This is the streaming context, all in one place. And for those of you who are developers in the audience, you'll be happy to see that you can even see exactly the bits from the official Apache repository that this notebook is based on. So I'm going to take this, and I'm going to start by loading the data set. So we'll do spark read text. And I'll point it at some JSON that I've stored on S3. So we'll do MNT data tweets. And then we'll just go ahead and display some rows from that data set. So it's actually going to go out to S3 and fetch that text data and display what it looks like. So what you'll see here is I've got a whole bunch of JSON. But if I want to actually take this kind of raw, unstructured data, and I want to break it down by time, and I want to create this graph of mentions over time, I'm going to have to do some transformations. So I'm going to take this and copy it, and we'll put it down here. 
And fortunately, the read interface actually supports a whole bunch of different formats, not just text. So I'm going to, in this case, it looks like JSON, but you can also use the data frame reader to connect to more advanced data sources like MySQL or Cassandra or Redshift, Parquet, uh, JSON, CSV, ORC. And so when I hit this, it's actually going to go and convert this data into a table. And once it's converted into a table, I can now use the data frame APIs to pull out only the information that I care about. Because as you can see, there's quite a bit of information here. So I'll do select. And the things I care about are created at and the text. So we'll go ahead and run that. And it's going to pull out just those two columns from the JSON data. So pretty cool. And this is what you would typically call ETL. So I'm going to use some markdown, which is a nice feature of notebooks, to explain what I'm doing as I go along. So we're going to do some ETL, which is turning unstructured into structured. Should have picked an easier word to spell. <laughs> and to be a little more concrete, I'm going to kind of describe exactly what I want to do to munge the data in this tweets. You can also put images into your markdown. So I'll do slash Im images slash tweet. And so you can see, given any tweet, there's kind of two transformations we need to do before we can actually build the graph that we're trying to make. So we need to take the timestamp and we need to bucket it by time. So you know, put it into our buckets. And then we also need to take each tweet and figure out who it's talking about. So in this case, this tweet is actually talking about two candidates. And this is an operation that's not particularly easy to do in SQL. So let's start with the window function. So I'm just going to go here and use the new window function, which we added in Spark 2.0 for streaming. But of course, you can also use it in batch. So I'll do window created at. And I'll say I want to bucket this by one hour intervals. And we'll call this new column window. And so what you'll see is it's actually going to take this first column, which says you know, when the tweet was actually created, and it's going to take the time 3.56 PM. It's going to put it into the 1,500-hour bucket. So now we've kind of grouped all of these into hour intervals. So now this, uh, this assigning tweets to candidates is actually a little bit harder. I need to take any single row, and I need to turn it into 0, 1, 2, or 3 rows, which isn't particularly easy to express in SQL, but is very easy to express in a programming language like Scala or Java or Python. So I'm going to show a couple of different APIs here. Here I used data frames. And now I'm going to use data sets. So I will use this function called explode. And I'm going to take the text and turn it in to a candidate. And we'll tell Scala that the text is going to be a string. And I'm going to create a list of candidates that we care about. So we'll say Hill, Burn. We'll use shortened versions of their names, so we'll catch things like Feel the Burn, and Trump. And we only want to output one of the candidates. I'm just going to copy this. Uh, we'll filter that so that it only shows up if the text contains that, that word. And we'll make it to lowercase so that we can actually uh, be a little more tolerant of, of what we're matching. Oh, OK. Can you see it now? Is that good? Maybe uh, I'll go one bigger. Cool. So we've got, we've got all of the data now in the form that we want. You can see that we've taken uh, tweets and we've actually assigned them to individual candidates. And uh, let's see, for example, in this case, this tweet uh, was actually talking about two different candidates. It's talking Donald Trump questioning Hillary, and it's assigned to both Hillary and Trump. So now we can take this and actually turn it in to a table. So you'll see this is actually going to kick off a fairly large Spark job. And this is another kind of case where notebooks actually make learning significantly easier. I can watch interactively what's going on in the cluster. It's taken this data set, it's split it into 200 pieces, and it's running it 100 tasks at a time in parallel. So while that's running, I'm actually going to switch over here to SQL. We'll uh, move that up so everyone can see. Uh, and I want to do kind of standard SQL aggregation. So I'll do a count star by the candidate in window from this tweets table that we just created. 
we want to group by the candidate in the window and order by the same. And we'll go ahead and display that. And so you can see it's run that analysis. And here's another pretty cool feature of notebooks. Instead of having to pull out a library, I can interactively graph these results right here in the browser. So I'll take this and turn it into a bar chart. And I'll say, actually, I want to color this by candidate. And it'd be better if this was a stacked bar chart. And we'll go ahead and click that. And what you can see is now we've got our temporal analysis of how different mentions of candidates changes over time. So that's pretty cool, but that's actually only part of it. I actually want to dive into specific topics and see how those change over time. So we'll say where text like. And let's say if I look at emails, which, uh, which candidate do you think they're going to be talking about? <laughs> And so <laughs> Twitter predicts <laughs> Hillary Clinton, and I think something probably happened on this day. Uh, and let's see what else. How about uh, feel the? Oh, and we had some very excited Bernie Sanders and these uh, supporters in these hours. Um, what about great again? <laughs> pretty, uh, pretty expected. What about something like small hands? <laughs> and <laughs> exactly as predicted. OK, so at this point, you're probably saying, I was promised streaming, and here he is doing all of this analysis on data from the 22nd of last month. Uh, and unfortunately, I've got bad news for you. If you're expecting me to come on stage and write a bunch of streaming code, I'm not going to do that, because I'm actually just going to take this batch code, and I'm going to copy this cell, and I'm going to paste it down here. And this is the true power of structured streaming and the unified APIs in Spark 2.0. All I have to do is take the exact same code I used in batch and point it instead at the Twitter fire, a replica of the Twitter fire hose, which I set up earlier. And now, when I hit Shift Enter, it's going to detect that there's actually a streaming part of this query plan. And instead of running a single query, it's actually going to run a lot of little queries over and over and over again, incrementally updating the answer as new data arrives. And this is an example of the continuous applications that Matei was talking about. So what you can see is as data streams in, new bars will be showing up, showing exactly how the mentions are going on on Twitter. So that's pretty cool that you can do this with one single API. But if I stopped here, I'd be cheating. Because the hard part of streaming is not always just getting the code working, but it's the operational aspects of taking that code, running in production, dealing with the scale. And this is another case where I think the interactive notebooks really shine. So here you can actually see a chart that's showing how we're processing data. And it's showing a couple of things. This top chart here is showing the rate at which data is arriving and the rate at which we're processing it. And in fact, that orange line is not good. We're falling behind. Data is arriving faster than we can process it. That's pretty embarrassing. But it turns out I'm not worried, because Matei promised me that there were going to be some performance improvements in Spark 2.0. So let's go ahead and turn those on. These are actually turned on by default, but you know, dramatic effect and everything. We'll go ahead and flip those on. And now that I've run this code gen command, what it's actually going to do is when it gets to the next batch, it's going to re-optimize the query plan. And the old query plan that was working with a single tuple at a time, passing it in between operators, has now changed. And instead, we're code genning an entire batch of operators in one thing. And it's, as you can see, significantly faster. <laughs> So what the green is showing you is that we've not only, like, we're not only able to process the data that arrived, but we can actually deal with all of the data that was backing up before. And as a result, the latency has dropped and the stream continues. So OK, that's pretty cool. And it's pretty nice to be able to do these kinds of analysis. Let's, uh, let's go through and review what we did. So starting at the top, we started with a bunch of unstructured text data. I'm just going to go ahead and clean this up while we go. And we took that and we did an ETL to transform that JSON into a structured table. And we did this using data frames and data sets. We then played around with this data set in batch to get our analysis exactly how we wanted. And then we took that same code and we applied it to a stream. And so what you'll see now is all of that code from the previous slide is now replaced by just a couple of lines of data frames, data sets, and SQL using Spark 2.0. 
So this is great in isolation, but the power of big data is being able to share your findings. And this is the reason that we built collaboration into the core of the Databricks community platform. I may want to take this, and I may want to send it to my boss, or I may want to even you know, post it on the internet. So if I click here and say publish, it's actually going to give me a URL, which is a static version of this notebook marked up with all of the information you need to run it. Other users of Community Edition can actually just click here and take this into their own copy, and, and uh, fr from there, they can remix it and do new things with it. So now comes my favorite part of the demo. Uh, I am actually you know, not a data scientist. I'm a SQL guy. And so I want to see what you guys can do with Databricks Community Edition. So I'm going to take the code for this, and I'm going to go ahead and tweet it. And I am very excited to see what you guys come up with. Thank you very much.